Father, we're thankful for your presence. And as we come together this Sabbath morning, we're pleased and privileged to be your children. Abide with us, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think we ever pray too much. What do you say? It is a blessing to be with you this Sabbath morning. We have a lot of things to cover as we start this morning. We have only one day. How many days? Just one. That means that in the three sessions that we have, we're going to need every minute, every moment, every particle of time that we have, because I believe that we're living in the most significant time in this world's history. Do you believe that? I believe that if we understand that, then our ability to study, our need to study, our earnestness in studying has to pick up. Do you know who this man is right here? Who is this? On the screen, who is that? This is Pope Francis. Does he mean anything? Yes or no? We're told in the spirit of prophecy that this man figures largely in the winding up of this earth's history. In Testimonies to Ministers 118, it tells us that we are to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. I think that that means that we need to study. What do you say? In fact, this gentleman, as we, as we would call him that, if we could, he's sitting there there. He looks very thoughtful. Do you think he's thoughtful? Great Controversy says that his, his, his view, his range is far and far reaching. Now, we know that a year or so ago he came on the cover of uh, Time magazine. We know that he was elected and so-called as the person or the man of the year. Now, my brothers and sisters, every Seventh-day Adventist should know what that means. Now, I believe that the reason why that we could be so comfortable even in seeing this is because we do not understand what our true message really is. I want to study it like never before. Do you want to study like that? There's a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy that says that there's a danger in the ignorance of our past what? We know this is a, a picture, an artist's picture of the Advent movement. You remember Sister White's first vision? And she said that as she was there before the altar and the Holy, she was praying, the Holy Spirit came upon her. And she said she was looking for the Advent people, but she didn't see them. And then she heard a voice say what? Look up, but look where? Look a little higher. And it says that there was a path cast up high above the world upon which the Advent people were traveling. And at the farther end of the path, Jesus was there. Is Jesus still there? Yes or no? Yes. Waving his glorious right hand and a light was coming from it. But behind them, at the beginning of the path, a light was set up. And that light, an angel said, was the midnight cry. Now the prophet speaking about this. In the book Evangelism, page 363, let's read this together. Father, anoint these words as we have opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. All together, it says, all genuine experience in religious doctrines will bear the impress of who? Jehovah. All should see the necessity of understanding the truth for themselves as a church. Is that what it says? It says understand themselves how? Individually. Now why is this? Now brothers and sisters, the Bible says, study to show thy self approved. This is an individual experience. Now, the prophet of God says, all should see the necessity of understanding the truth for themselves individually. We must understand the doctrines that have been studied out carefully and what else? See, we, we can never pray too much. We have to be earnest students, but with this, it must be mingled with an earnest prayer. It has been revealed to me, the prophet says, that there is among our people a great lack of knowledge. Now, this is not talking about the world. Now, we know the world is ignorant, just as the, uh, many of us in the church today. We know that the world is covered in darkness. The Bible says gross darkness covers the people. Now, this says, but this says it has been revealed to me that there is among whose people? Now, when she says our people, who is she talking about? This is God's people. This is seven Adventists. This is among our people, a great lack of knowledge in regard to two things. In regard to the what? Rise and progress of what message? The third angel's message. Now, when it says the rise, it means when the third angel came to us. The progression of the third angel. How, how is the third angel going to progress? Somebody talk to me. How is the third angel going to progress? It's one thing for it to rise. It's another thing for it to progress. What did you say? Yes, you have to tell it. Yes, but, but what is it going to progress into? Okay, here's a child. Uh, we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. Here's a child. Child grows, it starts as a child. But if the child progresses and it's a female, then the child grows and progresses from a girl to become a what? Woman. If it's a boy 
And he's born, he's developed and trained right. It starts as a child, as a boy, but it progresses to become a what? Man. So the third angel starts as the third angel, but it progresses. What does it become? You see the sign of the end? Yes, but there's something very specific that it progresses into. The loud cry. Inspiration says that the third angel will swell into a what? Loud cry of the third angel's message. So it starts simply as a third angel. But the third angel progresses, it develops and develops until it explodes, swells, bursts, explodes into the loud cry. It says that there's a great lack of knowledge of this right here. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a what? Do you understand that the devil's goal is to prevent the third angel from ever becoming the loud cry? You see, when the loud cry takes place, that's going to finish the work. The loud cry is going to reach the other sheep that are not in the Seventh Adventist Church. The loud cry is going to go through city to city, from village to village, to remote country places. The loud cry is going to make it so the entire world is going to hear the message in one generation and somebody is going to be ready to meet Jesus. And so the devil's plan is to stop this. Now, what should we be doing at this time? Because inspiration says there is a great need simply to come to church and have potluck. Is that what it says? There is a great need to search the book of what? Daniel and the book of what? Revelation. And learn the text, not carelessly, but what? Now, what does that mean when it says thoroughly? Does that mean that you just kind of flippantly go through the text? Or does that mean that means to be some earnest study? Earnest study. We're to learn the text thoroughly that we may know what is what? Written. Now, watch this now. Prophet goes on to say, same book, same page, next paragraph. It says, the light given me has been very forcibly that many would go out from what? Now, when it says us, what is it talking about? They're going to leave God's people, God's church. The people are going to be shaken out. It says they're going to go out from us giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It says the Lord desires that every soul who claims to believe the truth shall have an intelligent knowledge of what is what. Is it possible to say we have the truth but not intelligently understand what the truth is? Is it possible? Is it possible to be called a Seventh Adventist in profession but not possess the experience of Seventh Adventism? Yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, this says that this is why we must study individually, carefully, thoroughly. Then it says, it says, of what is true, false prophets will arise and will deceive. Not a few, but what? Does the Bible say the same thing? Yes. It says, everything is to be shaken that what? Can be shaken. That means there's come a violent shaking. And the church is going to be violently shaken. And everything that can is going to be shaken out. So those things that can remain will stay. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, what then must we be doing or should we be doing if we want to go through that shaking? What does it say? Then does it not become, how many of us? Everyone, Everyone to do what? Understand the reasons for our, we need to understand what our faith is. We need to understand why it is. We need to go back and be able to go to the Bible and study it text upon text. It says, in fact, in place of having so many sermons. You know, sometimes we come to church and we're used to having what? Sermons. You know, sermons can come, us, come to a place where it's just entertaining. We come there, we come to church almost like we're having popcorn. We just come to church and usually pop the popcorn. We just sit back and let the speaker talk, talk and the preacher preach. But is that, is that going to get us ready for the shaking? We're going to have to study the text thoroughly. And there's going to have to be something that actually substitutes sermon. Now, when we say take the place of, does that mean sermon and something else? Or does that mean something goes in place, sermon moved out, and something else comes in its place? Is that what it means? Yeah. So it says, what should be put in place of a sermon? What does it say? It says, in place of having so many sermons, there should be a more what? Close searching of what? So it's possible to have a sermon and not closely search and study the what? So you mean to tell me somebody can have a sermon on the third angel's message and that might not prepare us, whereas we must study the third angel's message? Is there a difference? Is it possible to read and not understand? Jesus said, whoso readeth, let him what? Understand. We've got to understand. Now this says, in place of having so many sermons, there should be a more close search of the word of God, opening, not just closing the books, but we should actually do what to the Bible? So I know all the texts. Is that right? No. <laughs> I know all the quotations. Is that right? No. We need to open them up. It says, opening the scriptures, how? 
text by text. And searching for the strong evidences that sustain the fundamental doctrines that have brought us where we now are upon the platform of what? Now that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm not going to preach to you this morning. Not, none of the time. We're not going to preach. We've got to study. We've got to go to the text. You see, the devil doesn't like this. This is what the devil has done. He's created an entertainment generation. Well, we have a generation today that wants to just sit down and be entertained but not study. But if we're going to go through the shaking, we've got to study. We've got to go text upon text. We've got to go quotation upon quotation. We've got to read, see, and then understand because I believe that a crisis is before us. Do you believe that? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that there's a crisis. All you have to do is open up your eyes. And if we're looking around the world, we can see that right now the world cannot continue much longer. That crisis is coming across the states, across the country. Right as we speak, there's rioting going on right now. Am I right or wrong? There's revolution going on right now. It's getting ready to get worse. And you think it's going to remain the way it is. And my brothers and sisters, Jesus has given us the diagnosis of this condition. Go to Matthew. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. If we look around, we see we're in trouble. Is America going to last much longer? Yes or no? Not the way it is. No, it's not. America is getting ready to collapse. Its political system is getting ready to collapse. Its religious system is getting ready to collapse. Its economic system is getting ready to collapse. Its judicial system is getting ready to collapse. The whole country that we look upon as being such a great nation is getting ready to collapse and go down the drain so that the devil can bring his false solution to this great problem. And you know, there's only one group of people that understand what can solve America's problems, and we're afraid to preach and practice what we profess to believe. We've got to go back. Now, what do we call ourselves? We call ourselves the U.S. Is that right? What does the U.S. stand for? Do you know what it stands for? What does it stand for? The United States. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How could a country so divided call ourselves the United States? There is not a place that you can look at and where we're united. If you look at the political condition, we're divided. You're divided between the left wing and the right wing. Am I right? You're divided. We're divided in this country between the Republican and the Democrat. That's not united. That's divided. If you look at the economic system today, it's division. You have high income and low income, then no income. Everything you have is divided. You don't have an economy that is united. You can look at the religious condition today and you have the Baptist and the Pentecostal and the Presbyterian and the Seventh Adventist and the Roman Catholic. You have a divided religion. It's not united. You look today at the social condition and today you have nations and nationalities that are convicted and put against each other. Right now in the day, there almost seems as it's going to explode into a race war. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that God intended that in a Seventh Adventist church that this should not be seen? That in the country of America, that God intended to be able to point to a seven Adventist church where every nation and kindred and tongue and people could show that the blood of Jesus can make something united that is divided. The country knows nothing about this. Now, because of the condition of division politically, socially, religiously, economically, what is getting ready to happen to this country? Matthew chapter 12. Let's let Jesus tell us. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 25, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, I've got to tell you the truth while I'm here. Do you want me to tell you the truth? Amen. I can come here and tell you that everything's all right, that our nation is okay, that our church is all right, that you and I are okay. I'm telling you, we're in trouble. And we're going to see that what is breaking out in Baltimore and New York and in all the countries is getting ready to get worse. It's getting ready to get much worse. And it's going to move from just a social problem, it's going to become a religious problem. And my brothers and sisters, all the hatred, all the hatred that has been multiplying. You know, all that is right now, there's intense hatred. Brother against brother. Money, those who have against those who have not. Those who win power against those who have no power. It's getting ready to explode into a revolution. And I'm going to tell you something. If there is any iota of hatred in us in any way, we're not going to be able to go through this crisis. We're going to be hated of all nations for the name of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I want to get my heart and my family in a condition where when this crisis breaks, we can go through it. Do you want to go through the crisis? Matthew 12 identifies what is going to happen into this divided country. The Bible says in verse 25, you're there, amen? amen? Let's read it together. Here's the diagnosis from Jesus, the great physician. And Jesus knew their what? Thoughts. And said unto them, every, what's the next word? Kingdom. Now, give me another name for a kingdom. Give me another name for a kingdom. 
every nation. We're told the kingdom will rise against kingdom, nation against nation. So the Bible says every kingdom or nation divided against itself is brought to what? Desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not what? Stand. Now my brothers and sisters, that means that the condition of this country cannot stand much longer. And if it can't stand, then what is it getting ready to do? It's getting ready to collapse. It's getting ready to fall. Babylon is fallen. This nation is getting ready to fall. And my brothers and sisters, the only ones that have a solution to this is Seventh-day Adventists. But my brothers and sisters, if we don't know our message, how can we bring a solution to this problem? We told you as we begin to go through this crisis. We told you that something is happening. What must God do in this state? Because our church is sleeping right now. You know that, don't you? And the only thing that can wake us up is present true. Do you want present true? Do you want present true? Now watch it now. Inspiration says... I saw, Earl the Writing 63, I saw the necessity of the messengers, especially watching and checking all fanaticism wherever they might see it, what? Rise. Satan is pressing on every side. And unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the what? Wicked, Wicked will hit us. Now let's read this together. What does it say? It says, there are what? Many precious truths contain where? Now, when I come to the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, there's a lot of precious truths there. Am I right? Do you know we don't have enough time to get all of the precious truths? So what should we do then? Someone said, well, what should we study? What should we go to if we don't have so much time? The prophet says there are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is what? Present truth that the flock needs when? So there are many things in the Bible that could be studied. Zacchaeus is in a tree. Is that in the Bible? He went up in the tree. Is that what we need to be studying now? Not unless we understand present truth from that. And there's some present truth exactly in the tree. We don't have time to study that today. But it says, I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of what? Present truth. To dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to do what? Unite the flock. And sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. You've got to understand, Satan knows he has to shut down the center of his church to put it asleep. And what he has done, he has made our denomination ignorant of what is present truth. We've got to understand this for ourselves. Does the Bible speak of present truth, yes or no? Second Peter chapter 1 tells us that we need this present truth. Now, all today, we're going to be studying a Sabbath day series that we have entitled, Uniting the Flock. Doing what? Uniting the flock for a finished work. Let's say that together. Uniting the flock for a finished work. I want to ask you a question. Can the work ever be finished if God's flock is not united? Yes or no? No. Could the early rain ever be poured out before the flock was united, yes or no? Will the latter rain be poured out before the flock is united, yes or no? The inspiration says in the latter rain, the God's people will remove in exact order like a company of soldiers. Now, what is it that's going to unite us? Is compromise going to unite the flock? Is error going to unite the flock? What's going to unite the flock, brothers and sisters? What did it say? What did it say? It says, I saw the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to do what? So one of the fruit of present truth is that what must present truth do to those who embrace it? Talk to me, somebody. You're not the flock. It says it is to unite the flock and then it's to sanctify the soul so that the work of God can be finished. Do you know today we have lost sight of what our mission is? Today we have a denomination that is thinking that the great objective of our denomination is simply to fill up a church. You know, if you can fill up a church and have a mega church, will that finish the work? How many people in this world today? How many people? Seven billion plus. Now I want to ask you a question. If we could be successful with bringing 7 billion people plus into the 7 of his church, well, then the work is finished. Is that right? You mean if we got everybody in the world into the 7 of his church, the work would not be finished? No. Now, see, this is the difference between present truth and anything else. We've got to understand that if it's not enough simply to get a man into the 7 of his church, then that means that the present truth is more than simply baptizing somebody. 
So then we have to find out then what is the work that present truth is designed to accomplish because this is what we must be engaged in right now. Are you with me? It is going to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. That's our study today. We're going to study this. United flock for a finished work. Now the first session, as we lay this foundation, now you know I'm at a disadvantage. I'm going to tell you my disadvantage. I'm not ashamed to tell you. I'm at a disadvantage right now. You know what my disadvantage is? My disadvantage is this. There's more truth and present truth than we have time to study this morning. You know that, don't you? Before we start, every subject that I get ready to turn to, a whole week can be done on each one we turn to. But we don't have a week to study. We have one day. We have a few sessions. Then that means that our minds have to be alert. That our bodies, our eyes, we should be praying, dear God, open my mind and my heart to study and understand because we have a lot of ground to cover today. Are you ready to study? Do you want to study? Did you bring pen and paper? Praise God. Now, you brought your Bibles. Praise God. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us that this present truth is going to wake us up. I think we need to stop right here. And I think we need to pray again and ask, dear God, please grant us your spirit as we get ready to get into this deeper into this first session. The first session, particularly in this series of Uniting the Flock for a Finished Word, this first session particularly is that we must understand what the real issue is. Did you hear what I said? What is the real issue? I'm going to tell you, there are 18 million Seventh day Adventists in the denomination today, and I can tell you that less than 1% actually understand what the real mission or the real issue really is. And so, what we want to study in this first session, we've got to understand what the real issue is. If we don't understand the real issue, the flock will never be united. The moment we understand what the real issue is, we're going to see a united flock that is prepared by the grace of God for a finished work. Do you want to understand what the real issue is? And we've got a few months to understand this. Only a few months. Because see, when, the, when, the, when this Pope comes back on the scene, it's not time to understand what the real issue is. When this Pope comes back on the scene, the deadly one's going to be healed. The prophet says, while the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to what? Is that happening right now? Has something, is something going to happen this year that has never happened in Protestant America? Yes or no? What has Protestant America asked to be done for the first time in the history of America and the world? What's the first thing? What's the first thing? That, he's going to, that, that, that America has asked the Pope to do what? To address what? The Congress and the Senate. This is where the legislation takes place. The House and the Senate. Now, my brothers and sisters, you must understand this has never happened. To have a Pope come before so-called Protestant America is a concession that Americans never, ever thought would ever take place in 1776. Something has happened to Protestant America. It says... Let us arouse to comprehend, understand the situation and view the contest before us in its true what? In other words, we don't, we don't understand how heavy this is. Do you know that there are not many sermons telling us what this means to America? And what this means to the Seventh Adventist Church? And what this means to you? And what this means to me? This means something very serious. And the Seventh Adventist Watchmen. Every seven Adventists is to be awake to what's taking place. It says, let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message, which is what? Present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awaking the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. You can't have the man of sin come to America and embrace him and still profess that that we're going to embrace civil and religious liberty. It cannot happen. And because of this, a great crisis is getting ready to take place in the United States of America that's going to become worldwide. We've been, you know what's amazing to me? We've been traveling these last few months from country to country. As we've been traveling, I noticed that in every country, there has been a move by the man of sin to round up every country in the world and everyone is lining up and is getting ready to set the stage. And the only ones that are not even aware of this are the United States of America. We're sitting down carelessly. Inspiration says, God calls upon us to do what? Awake, for the end is what? Do you think it's time to wake up, yes or no? Let's stop right here and pray. Dear God, wake us up. Would you join me as we pray together? Oh, Father in heaven, 
we're in trouble. The devil has been successful in pulling the wool over our eyes and we have not seen the stealthy approach of the papal power. But you're told and we've told us in a loud cry that all of his works will be unmasked and that you will expose the devil while you exalt Jesus. And Father, if ever there was a time when we needed a relationship with Jesus, it's now. If ever there was a time when we need to understand what present truth is, it's now. If ever there was a time to study and to get our children to study, oh Lord, it's not time to give them fairy tales. Let us study like never before. Give us the spirit of Jesus Christ. I plead that there will be a revival and reformation in our hearts and in this church so much so, Lord, that you will have a united flock for a finished work. Show us this morning what the real issue really is so that we can get ready before it is too late. We thank you, dear God. Remove every distraction. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to take our Bibles and turn to the last book of the Bible. We want to go to Revelation chapter 7. To Revelation chapter 7. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Revelation chapter 7. We're turning there. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're paying this picture. And we're not going to finish this session this morning, but we'll get as far as we can in the time that we have allotted, a little bit left. In Revelation chapter 7, we want to understand what the real issue is. What are we studying? We're studying the what? The real issue. What are we studying? We're studying the what? Now, I can see that we have to start some education right now this morning. Listen, listen. We're not preaching. We said in place of a sermon, we need to study the word of God. Is that right? So don't just think this is a church. We're told in Ministry of Healing that every church should be a school. It should be a what? School. Now, in a school, when a teacher asks a question in school, what does he want from his students? He wants his students to look back at him and do nothing. Is that right? What does a teacher want from his students when a teacher asks a question? Talk to me. He wants a response. He wants an answer. Is that right? Well, we've just converted this church into a school. Amen. Praise God. And so now that I ask you a question, I don't want you to sit back here and just say, that's not a school. And if it is, you know what they do in school. It used to be 50 years ago, if you did that, the teacher would have a ruler and he might knock you in the head. Is that right? There wasn't no child abuse, abuse laws that they have today. <laughs> they could still, they say, pray in the schools and in the, and in the schools, all this. They were, they were doing this back at that time and they were getting the attention of the students. By God's grace, we're going to get your attention. I don't have a, a, a ruler though, but I'm going to get your attention. Amen? Please. We've got to study. We've got to respond. All right. What are we studying this morning? What's the subject? We're studying the what? Real issue. We're studying the real issue. What we're studying? Real what are we studying, sister? Uh, yes, but what are we studying? Now, now, remember we said we got to, see, see, we got to slow down. So listen to me, listen to me. If we don't get anywhere, we better understand what the real issue is. Because see, we don't know what the issue is. If we, if we, do you know that a lot of people are saying they're studying present truth, they don't know what the real issue is. You have a man over here, he's saying sacred names is present truth. You have a man over here, he says the feast days is present truth. You have a man over here, he says that, that, that the 2520 is present truth. You have a man over here, he says that, that this is present truth. You have a man over here, he says this is present truth. Well, how do you know which one is present truth? Because a man says it? Because he has charts behind his head? Because he has a lot of power when he talks? That don't let you know what present truth is. You've got to be able to go to the Bible and understand for yourself what is present truth. Because everybody is saying they have present truth. And I'm going to tell you, much of it is of the devil. Did you hear what I said? Now, how can you distinguish between what present truth is? You've got to understand what is the real issue. You've got to understand what? So what are we studying? We're studying what? What are we studying? Praise God. What are we studying? We're studying what? The real issue. That's what we're studying. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 7, you begin to see that we have to understand this real issue quickly. Why? Because no matter where you turn in the world, a crisis is developing. If you were to go right now to Ukraine tonight, you know what you would see? If you were to go into Ukraine today, you would see a crisis. If you were to go into Russia today, what would you see? A crisis. If you were to go to the Middle East today in Syria or Iraq or Iran, what would you see? A crisis. If you were to materialize right not only in Europe but in America, right in Baltimore, New York, what would you see? A crisis. Right here in the United States of America, we see a crisis. And all of it is leading to one great and final crisis. Over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Revelation 7. Look at what it says beginning in verse 1. Are you there, amen? amen? Let's read that together. What does it say? The Bible says, And after these things I what? I saw four angels doing what? 
standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not do what? Blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on what? Now, here's the picture. John the Revelator saw our day in Bible prophecy. John saw a condition where revolution was getting ready to break out. The Bible says it this way in symbolic picture. It says that four angels were standing on the four corners of the earth. And what were those angels doing? Talk to me somebody. What were they doing? Holding the wind. What does the wind represent? Talk to me. It represents strength. It represents destruction. It represents bloodshed. It represents crisis upon crisis that's getting ready to let loose. Everything we see today is a symbol of the threatening of the winds getting ready to let loose. And God says, hold those winds back. You know why? Because we're not ready. Now the prophet continues to tell us about this. The prophet says why we're to hold these issues back. Because this church in this sleeping condition, notice what the prophet says concerning what this real issue really is. Now watch this now. Watch this now. The prophet says this. Let's read together. 1880 materials, 1046, it says, the time of trouble is what? Before us. The angels are, as it were, just loosening the what? Four winds, but they cannot loose them yet. The Bible, the prophet is talking about just what we see in the Bible. It says the angels cannot loose them yet. Why? Because of the condition of the world? No. It says it cannot loose them yet. Why? Because the what? Church is too far behind her what? That means that our greatest need is revival and reformation. And so because of the lack of revival and reformation, because of the lack of the condition of the church and understanding and practicing present truth, she's too far behind her privileges. And Tracen says, the people of God are too what? Inland. What does that mean? That means that they're only ignorant? Is that what it means? What does it mean? We're lazy. You believe that? It says we're lazy. It says, many are unfaithful, many are unclean and polluted. We are not prepared for the what? Now, do you know that not one of us in this room is ready for this crisis? And the reason why God is allowing the meetings to come to this church is because God knows we're not ready. And the reason why God has me here is not because I'm so much ready and my family is so much ready. It's because God is trying to get us ready. Do you know that God is trying to get the children ready? You know that? God is trying to get the families ready. You know that? But I'm going to tell you something. Unless we begin to start praying and studying for ourselves and stopping the foolishness at our homes, cutting off televisions, opening up Bibles and saying, as for me and my house, we're going to do what? You know that God is going to hold us responsible. We're behind. Now, this says, the question is, how long will God, what's the next word? Wait. Do you think God's going to wait forever? Is there a limit? We're going to see that clearly. It says, how long will God wait for our tardy movements? My brothers and sisters, do you know that God is not going to wait forever? And what is he waiting for? He's waiting until somebody can be sealed where? In their foreheads. Did the Bible say that? Look at verse 2. Revelation 7 and verse 2. Let's read verse 2. What does it say? It says, and I saw what? Another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And notice what he says in verse 3. What does it say? Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have what? Sealed the servants of our God. Where? Yeah. Now, if we don't get the seal, we're lost. If we get the seal, we're safe. And this reason says, well, every seven evidence is getting the seal. Is that what it says? Every child is getting the seal. Is that what it says? Every adult is getting... No, no. It says that the only ones that are going to be sealed are the servants of what? God. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that if we don't understand present truth, we'll never get sealed? And if we don't understand what the real issue is... Now, watch this now. Notice what the prophet says here. I want you to see this statement. Ministry of Healing 451. It says, more clearly than we do, we need to... What's the next word? understand the, what's the next word? Issues. issues. You know, we don't understand what the issues really are. A lot of people, they just come into church and sometimes they claim even to profess present truth, but we don't know what the real issue is. Right now today, somebody says, well, the real issue is that there are drums in the church. Is that the real issue? No. Someone says, well, the real issue is, well, well but because the, the, the dress reform is not being accepted, is that the real issue? Now, is that a problem? Yes, it is, but it's not the real issue. Someone says, well, what, what, what we have Jesuits in the church. They're snuck in and, and the Jesuits are doing everything. Is that the real issue? No. You see, all of these things that are taking place 
You can never understand them until first we understand what the real issue really is. And the devil has been successful in getting those who profess to believe present truth not to understand what the issues are. It says more clearly than we do. We need to understand the issues at stake in the great conflict in which we're engaged. We need to understand more fully the value of the truths of the word of God and the danger of allowing our what? <clears throat> minds to be diverted from them by the great deceiver. Now, if there's a real issue and I divert your mind from it, what are you studying then? <clears throat> Here's a main street. I, I pass by many main streets coming here. You pass by a main street. If you pass by a main street and all of a sudden you see another street off here to the side and, and, and that's not the street you're taking, what is that called? There's a side street. So you have a main street and you have a what? Side street. So if I have a real issue, then what do I have on the other side? I have a what? Side issue. So most people are being diverted into side issues and missing what the real issue is. And the devil wants it this way. And so what we have to do is understand that seven day Adventists were called into existence for a specific reason. Now I'm going to tell you something. What you're looking at on that screen has something to do with the real issue is he's inside of that most holy place. Is that right? And he's been there for how long? Since 1844. We're in 2015. That's over 170 years, and the real issue has something to do with Christ inside of that most holy place that we don't understand today. And the Bible says, without a vision, the people do what? That the people perish. Now, my brothers and sisters, let's get back now. And so we can see that God is trying to get us ready. If we don't understand this real issue, it never get sealed. So my question is, what is the real issue? I'm going to tell you what the real issue is, and then we're going to study a little bit in the time we have. Are you ready to study? Yes or no? What is the real issue? Go to the book of Luke, chapter 21. Let's see it. To the book of Luke, chapter 21. And we're studying the Bible. There used to be a time when, seven, you know, seven Adventists? Do you know we used to study the Bible like this? That years ago, that we used to take the Bible, instead of having sermons, we would go text upon text, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. We used to study this way. We were known as the people of the book, but not today. There was a time when a Jehovah's Witness, if he saw a seven Adventist on Sabbath morning with his black suit on coming to the church, they said, that's a seven Adventist. You better not study with him. He'll show you what the truth is. There was a time when the Baptists would know this and the Presbyterian would know this and the Methodists would know this. But today, if they see a seven Adventist, they want to get you into a corner because they know you don't know what you believe anymore. They're not afraid of us anymore. But my brothers and sisters, we've got to go back to the truth and understand what is the real issue that God may seal us in our foreheads. And just because we call ourselves seven Adventists doesn't mean we know what the real issue is. Listen to me. The servants of God. These are those, the Bible says, whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you what? Obey. obey. Now we're obeying the world and we're obeying ourselves and we're obeying the say, Satan and we call ourselves servants of Jesus. Everything he gives us, every standard he's given us, every uh, command he's given us, whether it's in diet or dress, education, we're disobeying and think that somehow we're servants that are going to get a seal in our forehead. What has deceived us? It's because we don't understand what the real issue is. Now, my brothers and sisters, the real issue is the plan of redemption. What did I say? The plan of redemption. The real issue is centered in the plan of redemption. If we don't understand that plan of redemption, no seal. If we don't understand that plan of redemption, we have no clue what present truth is. Plan of re the present truth is inside of the plan of what? Redemption. Now let's go to the Bible and see that. In the book of Luke chapter 21, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In the book of Luke chapter 21, now we want to be focused. We don't want to be distracted. Luke chapter 21, notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 25. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 25. Now, somebody says, plan of redemption. Everybody understands the plan of redemption. I wonder if we do. Right now today, well, someone says, well, the world doesn't know. Seven billion people, there are 21 major religions. And one of the leading religions of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church doesn't understand the plan of redemption. The Baptist, someone says, well, they talk about the cross. I'm going to tell you something. The plan of redemption is more than the cross. It includes the cross, but it's more than that. You see, my brothers and sisters, do you know that, that there, there's no other denomination that had the key of understanding the plan of redemption except Seventh-day Adventists? And of the Seventh-day Adventists, very few inside our church understand what the plan of redemption really is anymore. If you go to any Seventh-day Adventists, they will tell you they don't understand. In fact, go to the book of Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 25. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, and there shall be what? signs in the sun 
and in the moon, and in the what? Stars. These are signs of the last days. It says, and upon the earth, what else? Distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves doing what? Roaring. We are going through this. Verse 26 says, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be what? Then verse 27 says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and what else? This is the second coming of Jesus. And the Bible says, and when, verse 28, and when these things, not end, but when these things what? So when we begin to see these signs of the ends, what should we do when we begin to see these signs? Whether do what? The Bible says, then look up and lift up your head. Don't put them down, but lift up your heads. Why? For your what? Redemption. For your what? Redemption. For your redemption draweth what? Nigh. What does nigh mean? Near. Close. So the Bible is telling us that when Jesus said this in the signs of the last days, do you know that right now if you were to go to any church, the majority of the churches will tell you they don't understand this plan of redemption as given from the lips of Jesus. How do we know? If you were to ask a man today and ask him, when did the plan of redemption end? Or when does the plan of redemption end? You know what the Christian world would tell you? It ended at the cross. In 31 AD. Am I right or wrong? If you come into the Southern Adventist Church, do you know there was a time when we would not say that? But do you know after the new theology has brought in and the satanic system has taken control of a system of education, now today we have a theology that has come into the church that will tell us that everything finished at the cross. It is evangelical Babylonian wine that has seeped into the Southern Adventist Church. They will tell you it ended at the cross. And brothers and sisters, you must understand for yourself that you will never arrive at present truth if you believe that. And the reason why is because Jesus himself didn't teach that. How do we know? Here, Jesus is giving signs of the end of time. And he said at the very end that even then your redemption would not be over. He says your redemption will be what? So if it was not over at the end of time, how could it be over in 31 AD? So that means that we do not understand the plan of redemption even from Jesus Christ himself. That's his lips. Now, we then have to find out what has God given us to understand the plan of redemption. When he said, look up and lift up your heads, he wasn't talking about looking to the sky and you start looking up and, and studying the clouds. That's not what he's talking about. When he says, look up, that is an instruction to study. That's an instruction to search. That's an instruction to dig. That's an instruction to understand something. God is telling us that there's something up in heaven that you should be studying in which you can find the plan of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something here. Watch this now. The plan of redemption is the epitome of every truth that God has given us. It is the real issue. Let's read what the prophet says. In the book, Education, page 125. I like to read this quotation again and again, and then once I read it again, I read it again. It's wonderful. Now, watch what it says. Education 125, 126. Let's read it together. What does it say? It says, the central theme of the what? Now, when it says central, what does that mean? That's the main. So you have a main street, and then you have a what? Side street. So it says, the central theme of the Bible, does the Bible have a main street? Yes or no? Because we're going to find present truth in the word of God. Then what is the main street of the Bible? It says, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the what plan? So what is the main issue in the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation? What is the main issue? The plan of redemption. What is the real issue found in the plan of? <laughs> what happened to my class? What happened to my class? Now, if we're in a class and we're studying. Now, I'm going to tell you, hold back. We're going to have to put you at the back. And if nobody gets this, they can't leave. Amen? Praise God. We're going to station them and put some big men at the door. Nobody leaves. And you say, look, you start answering fast. And you say, I get that. You start getting that. You don't even know what the answer is. <laughs> Now, please, my brother and sister, listen to me. You've got to study. You, 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 you've let the devil do something to you. You've let the devil do something. The devil has duped us. He's deceived us. He's had us. We've got to wake up. And we've got to say, dear God, help me to get this. What is the real issue? It's found in the plan of what? Redemption. It says it's the central theme of the Bible. The theme about which every other in the whole book clusters. The restoration in the human soul of the image of God. From the first intimation of what? So this plan of redemption goes throughout the entire Bible. And it says the first time that it was intimated. Does anybody know what the word intimation means? What does the word intimation mean? Anyone know what that means? You're not sure? 
Okay, now, and, and now when you study, if you, if you were studying this in the spirit of prophecy and you're at home and you were studying this, what would you do if you were studying this? You would get a dictionary. That, that's what you, you need to do that. If you get a dictionary, you will find out that that word intimation, it means a hint. It doesn't tell you the real thing, but it gives you a hint. A hint gives you a clue. Are you with me? So when was the first time in the Bible that God gave a clue or a hint that there was a plan of redemption? When's the first time? In Genesis, the third chapter and the 15th verse. This is the central thing, this plan of redemption. First time it was hinted, Genesis 3.15. It says from the first intimation of hope. In the sentence pronounced in Eden, Genesis 3.15. What does that say anyway? It says, I will put what? Imagery between thee and the woman, between thy seed and what? Now what's that seed going to do? It said that seed is going to what? Bruise thy head and it shall bruise thy what? So now my brothers and sisters, that was the first intimation that a seed was coming, that a Messiah was going to come. Now this says, the, it says, from the first intimation of hope and the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of the what? What is the last glorious promise of Revelation? Where will we find that? Revelation 22 what? 4. Revelation 22 4. What does it say? They shall see his face and his name shall be in their what? Where's the seal of God going to be? Where's the seal of God going to be? In the foyer. So this plan takes us all the way from Genesis all the way to what? Revelation. So that means that if I were to take the Bible, that what plan spans the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it is the plan of redemption. That the same message is going from Genesis to Revelation. That means if I don't understand the plan of redemption, do I understand the book of Genesis? Yes or no? Do I understand the book of Daniel? Yes or no? Can I understand Revelation? Yes or no? Impossible. Do you know why in Revelation 13, you ever notice that in Revelation 13, the last verse of the Bible, uh, of that chapter of Revelation 13, it says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the, of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. It doesn't say everybody start counting. It says, here is what? Wisdom. Let him that hath what? So that means if I'm going to study the book of Revelation, there's something I must understand first. I wonder what it is. The plan of redemption. Now the prophet says, the burden of how many books? Every book. And of every passage of the Bible. That means every verse I go to, before I even read the verse, I know what it's about. If I'm reading Exodus or Chronicles, I'm reading about the plan of what? Redemption. And if I get away from the plan of redemption, I'm not on the central theme or the present truth. I'm on a side issue. Are you with me? I've got to understand how it fits into the plan of redemption in order to get present truth. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says the burden of every book and of every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. What wondrous theme is it talking about? The plan of redemption. Good. It says man's uplifting, the power of God, which give of us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He who grasps, what's the next two words? This thought. He who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study. Now, you're ready to study once you grasp this thought. If we don't understand this thought, you don't even need to study yet. That's why we start off here. This is the foundation. You can't understand anything else unless we understand this particular point right here. It says, he who grasps this thought. What does it mean to grasp? What does that mean? To grab hold of, to be able to understand, to let our minds wrap around it. Now, brothers and sisters, what is the thought that our mind has to wrap around before we have a field in the Bible in which we can dig into and study? What is the thought? Now, you got part of it now. You got the first, you got the big first part. We got, there's two parts to this thing. It's the plan of redemption. It's right there in the quotation. It's something about the plan of redemption that you must understand, though, before you're ready to study. Someone says, Victor, <laughs> that, that, now we got to get some Victor. This is true, but that's not what it is. Look at the quotation now. Look carefully at the quotation. Watch what it says. The burden of what? Every book. And every passage of the what? Bible is the unfolding of this what? He who grasps this thought. Now, my brothers and sisters, that is telling us that in order for the Bible to be a field of infinite study, I'm going to really understand it, that the thought I must grasp is that the foundation of every text, that the burden of every book, that the burden of every verse is something about explaining to me the plan of what? Now, once I understand that every verse and passage and book of the Bible is unfold that, now I'm ready to study. Are you with me? Because if before I turn there, I know what I'm studying. I know what the issue is. The issue is getting me to understand the plan of what? Redemption. The plan of what? 
Now you sound like you understand something, brother. Praise God. Now, this says he has the what? So once I grasp this thought, he has the key, he, he will grasp this thought, has before him an infant field, field for study. He has the key that will unlock to him how much? The whole treasure house of God's word. You ever studied the Bible before and you said, I can't seem to understand it. It won't open up to me. You know why? Because you got to have a key. Now, if I come to a church and the door is locked and I try to get inside the church, but the door is locked, how can I get inside the church? Can I open up the door? No. What must I do to that door in order to get inside and enjoy? What must I do? I must have a key to unlock it. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible will be locked up to us unless we have a key. Genesis will be locked up, Exodus locked up, Daniel locked up, Revelation locked up, until we have a key that can unlock Genesis, Revelation. And it's this thought that every text in the Bible, book in the Bible, verse in the Bible is explaining the plan of. Now, when I understand that, now I have a key that the whole Bible begins to open up. Now, so when the Bible says here is wisdom in Revelation, what is the burden of the book of Revelation? The plan of redemption. What is the burden of the verse, Revelation 13, verse 18? Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding. What is the burden of that verse? The plan of what? So what is it that I must understand if I'm going to understand the work of the beast, his image, his mark? What is it that I must understand before I begin to count the name and the number and the work of the beast? What must I understand first? The plan of what? My brothers and sisters, this is the real issue. Now, we must understand that our minds cannot understand that plan of redemption by itself. It is the mystery that even angels are desiring to look into. So the question is, what has Jesus given us to make plain the plan of redemption? What has he given us? Now, now you, 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 I, I, your mind, begin, I see your mind begin to open up now. Your eyes begin to look, your blood, I, you, your face is changing color. Your, you begin, the blood's beginning to flow now. Now, we got to study, brothers and sisters. Talk to me some. What has God given us? What has God given us to understand this plan? Because look, when we understand the plan of redemption, we can get the seal. When we understand the plan of redemption, we can understand what the real issue is. When we understand the plan of redemption, we can, we can get prepared for what's coming. We've got to understand that plan of redemption. So the question is, what has God given us to understand the plan of redemption? Talk to me, somebody. Someone says, this, someone says the Bible, but, but in the Bible... Someone says the testimony of Jesus, but there's something basic, foundational before all of that. You're going to find out that we got the testimony of Jesus from somewhere else. See, the testimony of Jesus is not the foundation. But there's something that God has given us that brought to us the testimony of Jesus. Go to the book of Psalms. Let's go to our Bible. Let's see. Let's go to the book of Psalms 77. Let's go to Psalm 77. Let's let, now, before I even tell you the verse, what is the foundation of Psalm 77? What, I, what I'm getting ready to read. What's the foundation of what I'm getting ready to read? Talk to me, somebody. The plan of redemption. I, 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 said, I, got, one, I got one good student over here. Praise God. What do the rest of the students say? What, what's getting ready to be read? Even Someone said, I don't know the verse. You don't have to know the verse yet. If you understand this principle, you will understand that every passage, every verse, every Bible, every chapter is to unfold one thought, and that is what? The plan of redemption. This is the real issue. From Genesis to Revelation, this is why we must take so much time understanding this. So before we look at it, we know what it's about. Now watch the Bible. Psalm 77, what has God given us to understand the plan of redemption? Beginning at verse 13. The Bible says in verse 13, the Bible says, Thy way wet, O God, is where? Is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as what? So God has given us something in the sanctuary. Is that right? Now watch this now. Watch what the prophet says. Here's that sanctuary. Watch what the prophet says. This takes us from Eden lost to Eden restored. They go, the whole plan of redemption goes in that sanctuary. Now watch what the prophet says. In the book, Great Controversy, page 488, 488, let's read that together. How many? All who have received the light upon these subjects, talking about the sanctuary, are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. Let's read this together. What's the next line say? What does it say? The sanctuary. Not on earth, but the sanctuary where? in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of man. It concerns how much? Every soul living where? Upon the earth. It. What is the it? I'm talking about the sanctuary in heaven. It's the sanctuary opens to view the what? So the sanctuary's goal is to reveal to us the plan of? Does the Bible say that? The Bible says thy way, O God, is where? Now, what way is in the sanctuary? Talk to me, somebody. What way is in the sanctuary? Someone says the way of righteousness. Let's read the text. Next verse. Next verse. 
Verse 14, Psalm 77, thy way was in the sanctuary. What way is this? Verse 14 says, thou art the God that does what? Now remember, it's the unfolding of this wondrous thing. Wondrous thing. It says, thou art the God that does wonders. Thou hast declared thy what? Strength. I wonder what shows how strong God is. It is just the power to pick something up or, or throw it down or create. I wonder if there's something that displays the power and the strength of God. Next verse. Verse 15. Thou hast with thy, what's the next word? Arm done what? Redeemed. Redeemed thy people. The sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Think about this. That's what that word Selah means. Now, so it says, thy way is in the sanctuary. What way is in the sanctuary? Verse 15. It says, thou has with thine arm redeemed. So it's the way of redemption. So what way is in the sanctuary is the way of Now, does the prophet say that? Does the prophet say that? That's what we just read. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. And everything the Bible says, the prophet says. Do you believe that? Amen. Well, then you're almost a seven Adventist. Now, this says that it opens to view the plan of redemption. We're talking about the sanctuary. Here the Bible says that thy way is in the sanctuary. What way? The way of redemption. Now, when I say the way of redemption, quoting from the text, what do I mean when I say the way? What does the Bible mean when it says the way? Now, imagine. When I came here, I was told where this place was, and I went around, the, uh, I was in the back somewhere, and all I saw was horses. I said, this can't be the place. Because all I see is horses and people. With horses. I said, no, this can't be the place. So I'm going around and around and around, and I had to call and say, what is the way? Are you with me? So if someone says, well, this is the way to get to the church. When you say this is the way, what do you mean? The directions. So when the Bible says, thy way is in the sanctuary, what's it talking about? It's talking about the directions of how God is going to redeem man. Are you with me? It says it opens to view the plan of redemption. Then it says, bringing us down to the very what? Now, brothers and sisters, listen to me. When you really study this sanctuary, not only do you understand what the issue is, but you begin to start understanding the time. Because this same sanctuary that shows us what time it is, the same sanctuary that shows us what the issue is, the same sanctuary will bring us down to the very end of time, proving that you and I are not in the first generation, but that you and I are in the final generation, the last generation, the limit generation, and that we have but a few short months to get these things right. And do you know, brothers and sisters, that no other church understands this? This is why God is telling us as Son of Venice, we've got to get back. And do you know that we've gotten away from this truth? You know that, don't you? In fact, go to Psalm 73. Go to Psalm 73. Now, watch this now. I've got to get ready to bring this first session to a close. Now, in volume 5, you, we've we got a few, a few ground to cover right here before we close this. Go quickly to Psalm 73. But I want you to notice this quotation. Volume 5, page 575. This is one of the most powerful quotations in all the spirit of prophecy on this point. I want you to write it down. We'll see it again before the day is over, but I want to introduce it to you right now. Volume 5, page 575. I wish you were taking notes. If you, have, if you were really wanting to see you'll be taking notes. Amen. Now, volume 5, 575. Let's read together. What does it say? It says, the great plan of what? Now, that's what we've been studying. It says, the great plan of redemption as revealed in the closing work of these last days should receive close examination. The scenes connected with the what? Sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all that they may be able to do what? Impress others. It says, all, not some, but how much? All need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the what? Now, I want to ask you a question. What work of atonement is going on right now? What work of atonement is going on right now? Now, please. And you wouldn't come to this church and just go to sleep. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't let, come to the church and let something distract you. What work of atonement is going on right now? What work of atonement? Is, is, is there a name for it in the Bible? Is there a name for this time? Is there a name for this time? What work of atonement? Is, investigative, but is there a work in the sanctuary? What does the sanctuary call it? The day of atonement. In Leviticus 16, in Leviticus 23, it speaks of a day of atonement. Do you know that that day of atonement is what brought seven Adventists into existence? That this day of atonement is what we've got to understand. But do you know right now today that we call ourselves present truth and seven Adventists, but we don't understand anything about that day of atonement. We don't really understand what this, this is the real issue. We don't understand what this message is all about. Information says all need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement, which is going on in the sanctuary above when this... Grand what? Now, I didn't say these grand truths. That's not, that's not what it says. It says when what? This. What does this mean? 
So there's one thing that we must understand right now, and this is the thing the devil doesn't want us to understand. It says, when this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will do what? It says, those who hold it will, it says, will, will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God, and their efforts will be what? Successful. So we're going to finish the work once we see and understand this grand truth. What is the grand truth? It is the work of atonement that is going on when? And my brothers and sisters, do you know what room that's going on? The sanctuary has, the sanctuary has how many places connected with it? The sanctuary has three places connected with it. Three places connected with that sanctuary. What are the three places connected with the sanctuary? The three places connected with the sanctuary, you have an outer court. Let me back it up. You have an outer court. You have a what? Holy place and you have a what? Most holy place. How many places connected with the sanctuary? Three. What are the three places? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Now, my brothers and sisters, you should know all those texts in the Bible to show you this. You should understand the text. It's because some people say, oh, seven of Venice made that up. But you know, in the Bible, the Bible speaks of an outer court. The Bible speaks of a holy place. The Bible speaks of most holy place. We don't have time today to go into that. But the Bible does. It gives all the texts. We need to study it thoroughly and understand this. But we're going somewhere before we close. Now, my brothers and sisters, if these three places are connected to the sanctuary, is the plan of redemption finished in the outer court? No? No. No. Is the plan of redemption finished in the holy place? No? No. No. Is the plan of redemption finished in the most holy place? Yes. So the plan of redemption is a work that began in the outer court. It began, not in the holy place, it began where? In the outer court. And that work that began in the outer court continues into the holy place, but it finishes the work where? In the what? Most holy place. So if I'm going to have a united flock for a finished work, I've got to understand the plan of redemption that is revealed in three places. What are the three places? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? If you just understood that, do you know that you would have the basis for seven-day Adventism? And it's simple. And the devil doesn't want us to understand this. Because, see, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question now. The Day of Atonement, does that happen in outer court? The Day of Atonement, does that happen in the holy place? Where does the Day of Atonement happen? Where? So the atonement that's going on right now is the work that takes us inside of the most holy place. Are you with me? This is the message of Seventh-day Adventism. This is the reason why we have so much problems in our church today because we've lost this. Do you know that we would not have a problem with dress reform or diet reform or health reform or education reform or music reform or women's ordination or any other thing that's interesting and coming to the church now if we understood the plan of that is found in the sanctuary. Now, if I'm going to understand the plan of redemption as found in the sanctuary, I've got to go somewhere. Where must I go to understand this plan of redemption? Because the first thing the prophet says, if we're going to finish the work, it says, all need to become more intelligent. And it says, when this grand truth is seen and what's the next word? So where must I go to understand the plan of redemption? Where must I go? Someone says, into the most holy place. Go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, beginning in verse 16. Psalm 73, beginning in verse 16. What does the Bible say in verse 16? It says, when I thought to know this, it was what? Too painful for me. Verse 17. Until I did what? Not outside of the sanctuary, but until I went where? Into the sanctuary of God. Then what? So when are we going to understand? Talk to me somebody. When are we going to understand? When are we going to understand? When will we understand? Let's go back to the text again. Let's go back to the text again. The answer is right in the text. The Bible says, until I went where? Into the sanctuary of God, then understood. Question, when are we going to understand? When will we understand? When we go into the what? Sanctuary. Can I understand from outside of the sanctuary? And the only way I'm going to understand, I've got to get into the sanctuary. Are you with me? Somebody says, well, I don't understand why we need to dress this way or eat this way or do this and not do that. I don't understand. You will never understand until we go into the sanctuary. And once we get into the sanctuary, then we will begin to understand the plan of redemption. Because thy way of redemption is inside the sanctuary. So when we get into the sanctuary, it begins to open up to us. And then we say, I understand, dear God. I see what present truth is. Now I understand what the real issue really is. Are you with me? Now, my brothers and sisters, and this is what we have to understand if we're going to work with God. Now, is this what formed the Seventh Adventist Church, yes or no? In 1844, on October 22nd, when this little group of Adventists who came from every other denomination, 
How did the Seven Adventist Church get formed? Because remember now, our great need is revival and what? But do you know that life and form go together? Is that right? Think about Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Does anybody know what that says? Anybody know what Genesis 2, 7 says? Can anybody know what Genesis 2, 7 says? Somebody tell me what Genesis 2, 7 says. Genesis 2, 7. If you don't know, go to the text. If you don't know, go to the text. What does Genesis 2, 7 say? Genesis 2 and verse 7. Somebody tell me what it says. Uh uh, not, you're not in Genesis 2. You're in, we want to go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 7. And God did what? And look, God formed man of the dust of the ground and then did what? Breathe into his nostrils the what? Breath of. So life and form go together. Is that right? Because it says God formed man and then breathe what? The breath of. So then life and form go together. Are you with me? Once man was formed, life was given into him. So life and form go together. Now, question. If the greatest need we have as a denomination is revival and reformation, we've got to understand what gave us life in the first place. All revive mean is a re again, vibe, vital, vitamin, life, life science. So the revive means to bring something back to what? Life. And reform means to do what? Something was formed, loss is formed, and then reform means to do what? Bring him back, shape him back, form him back. So if life and form go together, then re-life or revive and reform go together. All right, does it make sense? Now, an actual question. If the greatest need of the Seventh Adventist Church is to revive and reform, the only way to get revival and reformation, we've got to see what gave life in the first place in order to give life back. We've got to see what formed the Seventh Adventist Church in the first place in order to reform it. Are you with me? You can never use something to bring life again that didn't give it life in the first place. And you can never use something to form a church reform that didn't give it form in the first place. Does that make sense? Do you know that if a block party and a barbecue form the seven minutes church, then we need to have them to reform the church. If drums form the seven minutes church, then we need drums to reform the seven minutes church. If it was some uh, 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 nimble or great, great, all these various things that we say is the truth for this time, if it formed us, it will reform us. Does that make sense? So then we have to go back, if we don't understand our history, and find out what happened to give us life and form in 1844, because this will bring us life again. Whatever made us a people will keep us a people. Now, my brothers and sisters, what truth was revealed to us to bring the seven Adventist church into existence. It was one thing. Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Is that what happened to us? Yes or no? That's what must happen to us again. Revive and reform will only come when we go back into the sanctuary of God and then will we understand therein. The prophet says everyone needs now to seek the Lord. God's people will not endure the test unless there's a revival and a what? Reformation. Volume 7, page 284. So my brothers and sisters, this is our greatest need. We look at this. Let me get ready to close. Now, watch this. Now, my brothers and sisters, if there are only three places connected with the, seven, uh, with the sanctuary, then that means that there's something about these three places of the sanctuary that takes us from the beginning of the work to the end of the work. Now, what's the first place of the sanctuary? It's the what? Out of court. What's the first place of the sanctuary? It's the what? Holy place. What's the third place? It is the what? Most holy place. Now, my brothers and sisters, the work of redemption begins in the outer court, but the work of redemption is finished inside the most what? Now, do you know that every time that Christ moves in the sanctuary, a new church is established? Did you know that? That every time that Christ moves in his ministration inside the sanctuary, a new church is brought into existence. In fact, you will find that the First Testament church, that the First Testament church started in Genesis 3.15. Now, does you remember what happened in Genesis 3.15? Anybody know what happened in Genesis 3.15? Christ began by faith his work in the outer court. Did he, how, how do you know he began his work right at that point? How do you know? Someone said he put enmity, but there's, there's, there's something else, something else. But that's right, you, you're, you're in the long right place. But there's something else that happened. The Bible said, what did you say? The sacrifice, yes. But, 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 but Jesus didn't die in Genesis 3.15, did he? So how did he begin? What happened? The Bible says in Revelation 13 that he became the lamb slain from the what? Foundation of the world. It was done by faith that, 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 that God made a plan that should man sin, that God would put this plan into process. When did this plan get put into process? When man did what? 
sin. So in Genesis 3.15, Adam should have died, but there was a substitute that said, I would take his place. And immediately, once there was sin, there was already a savior. There was already a substitute, and he became the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And this is why Adam didn't die. He should have died immediately. The wages of sin is what? Death. And the only reason he did not die was because a lamb took his place. And by faith, the death was put on the charge of the lamb. That meant that Jesus began his work, Genesis 3.15. Immediately, he got, got into the outer court, and a church was established. What church was started in the outer court? It was the First Testament church. We call it later on the Hebrew church in the outer court. But every time Christ moves in the sanctuary, a new church is established. Now, how long did that church remain? When did a new church get established? Remember now, after Jesus in the outer court, Jesus moved from the outer court to the what? Holy place. Now, I want to ask you a question. When did Jesus move from the outer court to the holy place? Not 1844. No, 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 no. When he moved to, we should be seven Adventists. Listen to me. When he moved to the holy place, 31 A.D. In 31 A.D., Jesus got on the cross, crucified, and he said the last three words, it is finished. Now, most people think it's the plan of redemption, but that's not what happened. When you understand the sanctuary, we'll study a little bit more. We're going to find out that only his work as a lamb was done. His work as a priest had just begun. Praise God. Now, my brothers and sisters, you're going to find out that he finished phase one of the plan of redemption in the outer court. But that allowed him to transition from phase one to phase what? And the phase two, the work is not in the outer court now. The work is in the what? Holy place. So he moved into the holy place, 31 AD. A new church was established. What was the new church in 31 AD? The Christian church was established. 31 AD. You see him. The day of Pentecost takes place. A few days after Jesus uh, goes into, a uh, 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 few days after the death of the cross, 50 days later, the day of Pentecost takes place. The Holy Spirit comes. Thousands added to the church says you should be saved. And the New Testament uh, church, as, as we would call it, or the church of the holy place got started. The Christian church. But my brothers and sisters, that Christian church was established. But then Jesus moved again. When did he move? 1844, according to Daniel's prophecy. He moves now from the holy to the what? Most holy place. October 22nd, 1844. That means that a new church must be established. Are you with me? What church was established October 22nd, 1844 as Jesus moved into the most holy place? Talk to me, somebody. This remnant church of Bible prophecy. Revelation 12, 17 says there will be a remnant church. This is the seven Adventist church. Started 1844. Now, my brothers and sisters, how many more places in that sanctuary? How many more churches? So that church inside the most holy place is going to be the church that not begins the work. It's going to be the church that does what? Now, in order to finish that work, there has to be a united flock to finish his work. Now, my brothers and sisters, the devil knows there's only one church that understands this message or has the ability to understand this message. The Catholic church thinks it's finished at the cross. Baptist church says it's over at the cross. There's only one denomination that has the message that shows us that there is still a plan of redemption going on because, my brothers and sisters, if this plan of redemption is not finished, do you know that we're all lost? So we don't understand what is at stake in this message. Everything is still at stake. Now, we'll get deeper into this later on. Now, I want to ask you a question as we get ready to close. What do you think the devil's job will be then right now? I've got to shut down the seventh day Adventist church. I'm going to tell you something. He has said everything, every weapon in hell has been unleashed. And it appears that the church is about to fall. It appears that everything is going to go down, but it's not. God's going to shake it out and the sinners the will be shaken out. God's going to finish this work. But the question is, are we going to be a part of the team that God is going to use to finish this work? That's the question. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that team. What do you say? God is getting ready to unite the flock. And he's going to finish the work. We've been traveling from country to country. We've been going from place to place. And do you know that all over the world, somebody's getting ready right now. They're calling from Africa, from China, from India. They're writing back and they're telling us this message is going like wildfire. They, do you know they're taking this message? The, the very one you're hearing. 
And they're going on with laptops and cell phones and they're taking this message and in places where they can't even reach it, they're recording it. They're taking, they're taking where they have no power, no, and, and people are taking the message on these little devices and showing just what you're hearing and tribes and villages are becoming converted right now. And they're sending back the word to us that Jesus is getting the body ready and they're going from place to place. It's happening all over the world and the question is, are we going to be getting ready with it? Because see, this same sanctuary shows us that we have but a little time to get this word. You know that it has to happen on time. The plan of redemption has to be finished on time and we're going to prove that we have but a few short months to do this. If ever there was a time to study and get ready, the time is when? Now, this Pope, as we're going to study a little bit later, he's coming to America this year. Is that right? Something else is coming this year, too. A general conference session is coming when? A general conference session is coming this year. Now, my brothers and sisters, you've got to ask yourself the question, what's getting ready to take place? We're going to show you today, by the grace of God, the greatest shaking that we've ever seen is about to take place. And we're not ready for this. Our children are not ready. Our families are not ready. We are not ready. And the reason why this meeting is coming on today is because God wants us to have an opportunity before it is too late to understand what the real issue is, to begin to study it, to embrace it, because it's not enough to know it. Is that right? There's something we need to be doing about this. We're going to find out that, you know, in that most holy place, everything that you can do in the outer court, you can't do in that most holy place. There's some changes some revival, some reformation that has to take place inside that most holy place if the work's going to be finished and it starts with us. I say that we need Jesus. What are you saying? But Jesus is not in the outer court. He's not in the holy place. Jesus is in the I want to get where Jesus is. What are you saying? Let's stop and pray right here. Oh, the Heavenly Father, We barely even touch the surface of what we need to study today. But Lord, you want us to understand what the real issue is. And the real issue is found in this plan of redemption. And the only way to really understand this plan of redemption, we've got to go into the sanctuary. And when we go into that sanctuary, we begin to understand what you're doing. We begin to understand what present truth really is. And we see, Lord, that you have been in that most holy place now in 2015 for nearly 171 years. And Lord, we're not ready. Dear God, we're not ready. And if you are not able to finish your work in the most holy place very soon, then the whole plan of redemption will fail. Help us to understand this, Lord. Help us to understand that this is why you brought seven Adventists into existence, that there's a great work that must be accomplished in a little time. And no one else knows this but us, dear God. And today, most seven Adventists don't even know this anymore. We've been robbed. This message has been stolen from us. The thief has taken this message. And dear God, it's time for us to take it back. It's time for us to stand in defense that was once delivered to the saints. Father, give us an understanding of this message first that we might live differently. And that we might share with others before it is too late. I pause the prayer. If there's someone here this morning that says, Dear God, I want to understand this, but not just understand this. I want this to change my life so that I can be a part of this team that's going to finish the work. If you want that this morning, this Sabbath morning, just raise your hand wherever you are. You're saying, Dear God, I want to be a part of the team that you're making up. God's making up a team. I want to be a part of it. And that whatever needs to come out of my life, I want to consecrate myself to Jesus so that God can get me to be a part of the team that he's going to use. Heavenly Father, you see our lifted hands supply the fact we can do nothing without Jesus. Give us an experience where you may unite the flock for a finished work. Thank you for what you've done this morning. Be with us this whole day. Hold back time so that we can get all that we need so that we can be ready to meet you. We thank you for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.